Presbyterian headquarters here in Geneva. Welcome to a regular press briefing on COVID-19. Uh, today is uh, June 17, 2020. Uh, today with us uh, we have uh, Dr. Tedros, as always, WHO Director General, and as we usually do, uh, with us uh, we have Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, who is technical lead for COVID-19, Dr. Mike Ryan, who is the head of uh, emergency programs, and we have a free other uh, guests uh, today from WHO. We have uh, Dr. Mwele Malecella, who is a WHO Director for Neglected Tropical Diseases. We have uh, Dr. Janet Diaz, who is a Head of Clinical Care uh, at uh, COVID-19 Response. And we also have uh, Dr. Ana Maria Henao Restrepo, who is the Head of the Research and Development Unit and working on a blueprint uh, at WHO. Uh, I will uh, remind journalists who are watching us on Zoom that uh, you can listen uh, this press briefing in six Korean languages plus Portuguese plus Hindi if you do that uh, through your settings on Zoom. You can also ask your questions in six Korean languages and Portuguese. Today our press conference will be a little bit shorter than usual. We have to finish by six o'clock uh, Geneva time. So we will try to be concise in answering and also asking questions. Now I will give the floor to Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. The world has now recorded more than 8 million cases of COVID-19. In the past first two months, 85,000 cases were reported. But in the past two months, six million cases have been reported. There have been more than 435,000 deaths in the Americas, Africa, and South Asia. Cases are still rapidly rising. However, there are green shoots of hope, which show that together, through global solidarity, humanity can overcome this pandemic. We now have examples of many countries, good examples, that have shown how to effectively suppress the virus with a combination of testing, tracing, and quarantining patients and caring for those that get sick. Lab capacity has been dramatically enhanced across the world to boost COVID-19 testing, which is critical for identifying where the virus is and informing government actions. New mega hubs have been established that are now key to the distribution of personal protective equipment, which includes millions of masks, goggles, aprons, and gloves, as well as other medical supplies. Tech companies have developed applications that can assist with the critical task of contact tracing. And there has been an enormous effort to accelerate the science around the pandemic. Early on in the outbreak on 11th February, WHO convened a research and innovation forum on COVID-19, where hundreds of researchers came together from across the world with the aim of quickly developing quality diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. One of the key priorities identified was for the world to focus on accelerating research around treating patients with COVID-19, specifically Researchers agreed to investigate existing drugs with potential, including steroids. WHO also developed a core protocol, which has been adapted and used by researchers around the world. And yesterday, there was the welcome news of positive initial results from the recovery trial in the United Kingdom. Dexamethasone, a common steroid, has been shown to have a beneficial effect on those patients severely ill with COVID-19. According to early findings shared with WHO, for patients on oxygen alone, the treatment was shown to reduce mortality by about one-fifth. And for patients requiring a ventilator, mortality was reduced by about one-third. However, dexamethasone was shown to not have a beneficial effect for those with milder disease who did not need respiratory support. This is very welcome news for those patients with severe illness. These drugs should only be used under close clinical supervision. We need more therapeutics that can be used to tackle the virus 
including those with milder symptoms. WHO has now started to coordinate a meta-analysis pooling data from several clinical trials to increase our overall understanding of this intervention. And we will update our clinical guidance to reflect how and when dexamethasone should be used to treat COVID-19. I want to thank the United Kingdom government, the University of Oxford, and the many hospitals, researchers, patients, and families who have contributed to this scientific breakthrough. WHO will continue to work with all partners to develop other therapeutics and vaccines for COVID-19, including through the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. Over the coming weeks and months, we hope there will be more treatments that improve patient outcomes and save lives. While we're searching for COVID-19 treatments, we must continue strong efforts to prevent as many infections as possible by finding, isolating, testing, and caring for every case and tracing and quarantining every contact. COVID-19 is affecting the whole world but it's important to remember that for the most vulnerable communities, this is just one of many threats they face. We have consistently stressed the importance of ensuring essential health services to continue, continue, including routine vaccination and services for malaria, TB, and HIV. Today, I want to touch on neglected tropical diseases, an issue I care deeply about. NTDs are a group of 20 diseases, including elephantiasis, sleeping sickness, leprosy, trachoma, and intestinal worms that collectively wreak havoc on the poorest and most marginalized communities. These diseases disfigure, disable, and can kill, and they strike hardest in places, places of poverty and in remote areas where access to quality health services is extremely limited. WHO and partners have developed a new roadmap which moves away from single disease programs to integrated approaches to the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of neglected tropical diseases as part of an overall movement toward, toward universal health coverage. The NTD roadmap puts greater ownership on national and local governments to drive action. Like with COVID-19, it calls for greater collaboration between governments, academia, civil society, and the private sector in order to boost innovation and access to health technologies. I have seen firsthand the courage of people who are living with entities, which is why I call on countries not to forget about the most vulnerable. Together, we can achieve anything, and I'm encouraged by progress in tackling the Ebola outbreak in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. If there are no more cases in the next seven days, the government of DRC will be able to declare the outbreak over. The lessons learned and experience gained by Congolese health workers are now being applied to inform the Ebola outbreak response in the west of the DRC, as well as broader lessons on testing and contact tracing, which are directly transferable for tackling COVID-19. I thank you. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Tedros. And just to remind you that uh, we have uh, our director for neglected tropical diseases uh, here, Dr. Mwele Malachela, who can talk more about the roadmap that uh, Dr. Tedros just mentioned. We will uh, start with the questions. Uh, please be concise and one question per person. We will start with FA News Agency and we have uh, Antonio Brato. Antonio, can you unmute please? Antonio, hey, hola. ¿me escuchan? Sí, te escuchamos. <laughs> Gracias, Ari. Eh, mi pregunta es sobre la dexametasona. Desde la OMS, eh, ustedes celebran este hallazgo de la Universidad de Oxford, pero ¿debería la población general actuar con cautela respecto al consumo de este medicamento, por ejemplo, a la hora de, de hacerlo 
de forma preventiva. Muchas gracias. Sí, um, yes, um, absolutamente. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very glad you've asked this question. And uh, Janet and Anna Maria may wish to supplement. Uh, it, it, it's exceptionally important that, that, that this drug is used under medical supervision. This is not for mild cases. This is not for prophylaxis. This is a, a very, very powerful anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, it can rescue patients who are in very serious condition where their lungs and their cardiovascular system around their lungs may be very inflamed. So this allows... Uh, possibly that patients are able to continue getting oxygen into their blood from their lungs for a very critical period by rapidly reducing inflammation at a critical period in their illness. It is not a treatment for the virus itself. It is not a prevention for the virus. In fact, uh, steroids, uh, particularly powerful steroids, can be associated with uh, viral replication. In other words, they can actually uh, facilitate the, 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 the division and, and replication of viruses in human bodies. So it's exceptionally important in this case that this drug is reserved for use in severely ill uh, and critical patients who can benefit from this drug clearly. And as the Director General said, uh, th this is great news, but it is part of the answer we need on the clinical side. Oxygen, ventilation, the use of uh, <clears throat> antivirals, the use of, uh, of steroids, and finding a combination of therapies that allows us to save as many patients as possible. Janet? Thank you. Um, so, no, I just have to echo the, the benefit was seen in patients who are on oxygen therapy, so who had already lung injury, or those patients that were on ventilation. So there was no benefit seen in the patients that had mild disease. So this is, the, and this study was not for prophylaxis. So I think the, the, that is the take home message as you've described, uh, Mike. Uh, many thanks. Uh, so next question will go to Jason from NPR, Jason Bobian. Jason? Uh, can you just press unmute? Please, Jason, can you press unmute so we get uh, we get to you? Sorry, can you uh, yeah, can no, you hear me now? Now it's fine. My, it's... my apologies on that. Um, I was just wondering if you could just talk any more about. Um, the continued work with the United States in terms of um, ongoing programs. What what are things most things continuing to to go forward in terms of work with the United States? So I I can start and then and then others might want to supplement. I I can speak to the work that we do uh, with the United States for COVID nineteen and other programs. So yes, of course, uh, you know we work with scientists all over the world including uh, American scientists and public health professionals and medical professionals, um, mainly in our day-to-day um, -day work through collaborative international networks. So we have established international networks of experts for uh, clinical management, for vaccine development and therapeutics, for mathematical modeling, for infection prevention and control, for risk communication, um, for many different areas of work. And those include scientists from, from the United States, from US CDC, from NIH, uh, and many academic groups. Um, and so that will continue. Um, we also uh, work, of course, with, with scientists from many countries all over the world. And I think that's one of the, the strengths that we have as an organization, to bring people together to share first-hand experience, first-hand practical experience with patients, in health facilities, in communities, um, to be able to exchange. And we will continue to learn from one another. Um, I fully agree with, uh, with Maria. And uh, our collaborating and beyond COVID, uh, we have many, many collaborating centers all over the United States, uh, hugely important contributions that they individually and collectively make to global health. And, and, I, and I think the, 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 the issue here is that these institutions and individuals are contributing to global health. We all work on global health together. We all work together to ensure that we improve the health experience, the health outcomes, uh, and the survival of, of all people uh, on this planet. Uh, and we really do recognize and thank the, 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 the power of U.S. scientists and U.S. scientists and public health professionals. In fact, today we have uh, 
Maria from the east coast of the United States, Janet from the west coast of the United States, and, uh, and the Americas is equally further represented by Anna Maria Hanna from uh, the country of Colombia. So uh, the, the most represented uh, group at this table right now is the Americas and the United States of America from the perspective of how U.S. citizens around the world contribute not only to the health and welfare of Americans, but to the health and welfare of the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Diaz and Dr. Ryan and Maria on these. So we will go to Yahoo Finance, and we have An Anjali online. Anjali, hello. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Anjali, if possible? If it's not working, we will try to go to uh, uh, Siddhant Mamtani from India TV. Siddhant, can you hear us? Hello? Yes, please. Yeah. So my question is also about the dexamethasone drug trials. Uh, have there been any talks of initiating the uh, trials on a much wider scale? And uh, would you say that this drug would stand... Um, of, I mean, I mean, it, the drug could be used as a drug that is both feasible uh, in efficiently providing it to patients all across the world and also effective against coronavirus. Thank you. Um, thank you. Let me just restate that this drug, we have, first of all, and with great congratulations to my colleague Peter Horby and, 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 and all of the great researchers in the UK and, the, and as the Director General said to the doctors, the nurses, the patients, their families who participated in this. Um, it is one, but of the many breakthroughs we're going to need in order to effectively deal with COVID-19. Um, and, and as such, we should celebrate that today. But it's still just preliminary data. It's from one study. It's very significant, but we also have to see the real data, the full data. Um, and we thank uh, our colleagues in the UK for, <clears throat> for briefing us, but we still obviously, and they will be working very hard over the coming days to release detailed data to get this published in peer-reviewed journals uh, so everybody can see what the, the results are. From that, at the same time, Janet and her team will be uh, doing some work on more systematic reviews around other data that may be available around the world. And on that basis, we will pull together the necessary expert group to look at all of that, both on the research and the clinical side, and come to a conclusion around <clears throat> uh, our, our clinical advice to countries. And it's important that each country takes that a measured approach as well. <clears throat> this is not the time to rush <clears throat> to uh, change clinical practice in a too rushed a fashion. Uh, people need training. We need to understand what doses to be used, how patients are going to be clinically assessed. Uh, we need to make sure there are supplies of the drug. We need to look at a lot of, lot of things. So while we're very pleased today, uh, we still need to see the, the final data. We need to adjust the clinical guidelines that will be needed, and we need to support countries to both access and utilize this drug in the most appropriate way possible. And let me state again, it cannot be said strongly enough, this drug is purely for use under close clinical supervision. It is meant and has only been shown so far to be useful in the treatment of severely ill people with COVID-19, uh, those people on oxygen, those people who are ventilated. And while we're very pleased to see a life-saving intervention emerge, please, please uh, let us use it and, and take forward the use of this drug for what it has shown to be beneficial uh, in doing. Janice? There we go. Just to echo that, it is uh, really important to see the full data, the full report from the manuscript in a peer-reviewed journal, so we look forward to that. Uh, currently, we know there are other ongoing randomized control trials testing uh, uh, steroids uh, for COVID-19, and we are assembling and coordinating to uh, aggregate data from those trials um, in a meta-analysis to, to give us a bigger perspective, a wider perspective of the studies um, that are ongoing. And then at the same time, putting into place the mechanisms in order to uh, update our guidance in a transparent and trustworthy way with global experts representing all regions of the world uh, in a in the very near future. So all that's going on in place. And again, just to echo, this is something that should be used 
in hospital for severe patients, for those that are critically ill but not for mild patients. And we hope in the very near future to have more, um, you know, uh, our recommendations more clear, the practice protocols uh, adjusted accordingly, and um, other tools to assist frontline clinicians and member states uh, to make the appropriate adjustments to their national guidelines. Many thanks. Uh, next question comes from um, CCTV. We have Shane uh, with us. Shane? Shane? Just a second. Go ahead, please. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, now it's fine. Okay, thank you, Derek. Question to Dr. Tadros. Uh, Dr. Tadros, you have attended the extraordinary China Africa Summit on Solidarity Against COVID 19 today. And what do you think about the meaning of this summit? And what do you think about China's support to the African countries in the fight against COVID-19? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So the China-Africa summit, uh, FOCAC, um, uh, is one of the platforms where China and Africa uh, partner. And during this uh, COVID situation, uh, a special uh, session was uh, organized by China, uh, South Africa, and Senegal. The three leaders have co-hosted this uh, meeting and with a specific agenda uh, of uh, fighting uh, COVID uh, together. Uh, so uh, as you know, since the pandemic uh, started, uh, China has been supporting uh, Africa and many countries have already outlined the kind of support uh, they have been uh, getting, uh, especially in sending uh, experts, uh, in sharing information, uh, in addition to that in providing, supporting with supplies, uh, test kits. Uh, it's not only the um, health part, uh, they have also uh, raised the issue of um, uh, economic recovery and debt relief that China is willing to support with. So these were the um, areas of cooperation that were uh, stressed uh, or outlined. And since the pandemic is uh, still not over, and uh, although the number of cases in Africa is the loss compared to other regions, uh, but it's also at the same time accelerating, um, the support that, appreciating the support that has already been given, uh, but I think they have agreed to give uh, more uh, support and uh, uh, because uh, the pandemic is uh, accelerating. So this is what I would like to um, say in, in, in a brief. But as I always say, um, this pandemic is, um, or this virus is a very dangerous virus. Uh, and it has uh, two dangerous combinations. Uh, it moves fast and it's a killer. And it surprised many countries, including developed nations. Um, and the answer is to fight in unison. Unity and solidarity are very important to defeat uh, this virus. When unity and solidarity is lacking, when there is a crack between us, the virus exploits that crack between us, the differences between, between us. And that's why national unity and global solidarity is important. And platforms like this will be important in strengthening, like the China-Africa, in strengthening uh, solidarity uh, across uh, the globe. And this should really be followed by uh, global uh, solidarity um, to uh, help speed up the uh, defeat of, of, of this uh, virus. So I would like to use this opportunity to call on unity and solidarity of the whole uh, world. In my speech, I said, um, I compared actually, in the first two months, it was 85,000 cases. And more than 90% of them, by the way, were, uh, were in uh, China. 
But if you take the last two months, this is from April, mid-April up to now, mid-June, in just two months, six million cases. From this, you can see how the virus is accelerating and moving, moving really fast. We can move faster because it's only by moving faster than we can defeat it. And to move faster, the most important element is unity and solidarity, which is political. And that's what we should really strengthen, national unity and global solidarity. Thank you. Next question is coming from New York Times. We have uh, David uh, Wallstein with us. David? If you unmute yourself, we will hear you. Hi, sorry about that. Um, uh, on Monday, uh, Dr. Ryan, you mentioned that you might have some kind of a, a decision on hydroxychloroquine. Are you on that? Uh, one, one should never promise what one doesn't deliver. Yes, uh, we've been in. Uh, we've been uh, discussing with the and, and again because of the independent nature of the solidarity trial and the fact that it has its own executive committee and its own data safety monitoring board, we've been discussing with the executive group that oversees the trial, um, the process now for, for looking at the data. The, uh, Anna Maria can confirm, but the, the, the executive committee now and the DSMB are looking at the data across a number of, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, she will, uh, just outline the the process uh, for that, but as of uh, as of today, we are awaiting the uh, the decision and analysis of the of the steering committee for the group and the analysis of the DSMB. Maria, Anna Maria. Is this on? Yes, thank you, Mike. <clears throat> so, uh, as Mike reported and DG reported a few weeks ago, we took three actions. The first action was to conduct the systematic review of the evidence that was conducted by the Cochrane Collaboration, one of our collaborators. The second is we look into the safety of hydroxychloroquine among the patients vaccinated, uh, vaccinated who were treated in the solidarity trial and in the discovery trial in France, our uh, sister companion trial. And the third thing that we promise is that we will look into the evidence through our data safety monitoring committee. After completing these three uh, steps, uh, we have a, com a communication with our executive group that is formed by the representatives of seven of the member states who are participating in the trial. And today, just five minutes ago, we finalized a call with all the investigators in the trial. On the basis of the evidence that is available to the investigators, to the secretariat, to the executive group, and to the DSMC, a decision was made to uh, stop the randomization with the hydroxychloroquine trial on the basis of two pieces of information. The first, the data that was published by the UK trial, and second, the data that was available to us uh, from the solidarity trial. Um, I will stop here. Thank you, Dr. Henao, who is, uh, just to remind everyone, the head of our research and development blueprint unit at WHO. I understand that we have a question uh, on, um, on uh, NTDs, uh, neglected tropical diseases. Our friend uh, Simon Ateba is online and would like to ask that. Simon. Hey, th yeah, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my name is Simon Ateba from Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. And I would like the expert, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I can't see the name very well from where I am, but I would like the African expert on the panel to tell us how, uh, tell us about all those neglected diseases in Africa and how COVID-19 is affecting them. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, it's without a doubt that COVID-19 has wreaked havoc in the world, and one of the place, one of the things that has been since severely affected is our neglected tropical disease programs uh, worldwide, um, um, and particularly, particularly in Africa. We've had to, as part of the uh, focus on social distancing, we've had to stop most of the mass drug administration uh, programs in 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 Africa, and so the idea is now to think about 
uh, when, when we go back post-COVID, how are we going to do our programs? What is the way that we're going to do our programs better? Are there innovative ways that we can actually carry out these programs where people can be treated safely uh, and not necessarily through mass drug administration, but making sure the safety of the people being treated and the safety of the community health workers who are treating them. So that is the, that is the discussion that is ongoing, but we have still, as WHO issued guidance, that all programs that uh, involve any kind of mass drug administration should be, uh, should be halted. And uh, as a follow-up to that, there are diseases which require uh, uh, treatment, uh, immediate treatment, diseases like leishmaniasis, which are also part of the uh, neglected tropical disease group. And those diseases, uh, people are still required to go to, uh, to, to health facilities and get the, the requisite treatment. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, uh, Dr. Malachala. So for Simon, uh, if you can't see it, but we will send you, it's uh, Dr. Mwale Malachala, Director of WHO Program for Neglected Tropical Diseases. Uh, we will go now to Globo, Brazil, uh, Bianca Gauthier. Hi, Tarek. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thanks a lot. Uh, my question is to Dr. Mike Ryan. Uh, how do you see the situation in Brazil now? Do you think the number of deaths has stabilized? Do you see any sign of stabilization? And if so, what does it mean exactly? What signs it can give us? Thanks. Yeah. I hey, is this not working? It's working now? Okay. Yeah, I think the, uh, the epidemic is still quite severe <clears throat> in Brazil. Uh, I believe uh, health workers are, as we've said before, working extremely hard and under, uh, under pressure to be able to deal with the number of cases that they see on a daily basis. Um, but certainly the, 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 <clears throat> the rise is not uh, as exponential as it was uh, previously. So there are some signs that the situation is stabilizing, but we've seen this before in other um, epidemics in other countries. You can see a sign of stabilization for a day or a few days, and then it can, the disease can take off again. So what I would say is it's a moment of extreme caution uh, in, in Brazil. The, there needs to be uh, uh, a focus on physical distancing, on hygiene, uh, on reduced uh, crowding, and, and being able to support populations, particularly uh, populations from uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic minorities, for people living in difficult uh, conditions in urban environments and, and, and poorer conditions. It's difficult for people to do social distancing. It's difficult for people to maintain personal hygiene, and we have to try and support them in, in that. So it is, uh, I think, from the perspective of Brazil, a moment now to really double down, to really focus on the public health and social measures, to focus on supporting communities who find it uh, both difficult to sustain that and also have a greater impact in terms of health, to ensure that the hospital system continues to function and is able to cope with uh, severely ill patients. Uh, if all of that is done, then we would expect uh, Brazil has a historically, uh, as I've said previously, a, a proud history of containing uh, and suppressing infectious diseases. And I have no doubt that if the full skill, um, uh, commitment, ingenuity of the Brazilian state, of the, of the provinces, of the people is leveraged in a united sustained and combined way that Brazil will bring this disease under control and will succeed. Uh, in emerging from this uh, uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Next question um, is uh, from Mexico. We have uh, Paulina Ancadena from Cancun. Paulina, if you unmute yourself, we will hear you. Hola, si me escuchan? Si, te escuchamos. Gracias a todos. Gracias, Tarek. Quisiera preguntarles, en Cancún y en general en Quintana Roo, entramos en temporada ya de dengue y chikungunya. ¿Pueden estos síntomas mimetizarse y o agravarse con COVID? ¿Qué ventana tenemos para diferenciarlos? ¿Qué es la recomendación que nos pueden dar? Gracias. Gracias. 
Oh, I can start and then, and then others can supplement. So that, that's a very good question and, and it, it highlights the, the need to ensure that we have surveillance systems in place for not only COVID-19 but for other pathogens that are circulating. Um, and in, in fact, you know, this morning uh, I had a call with uh, teams across NTD and my own team looking at arboviruses and looking at dengue and yellow fever and chikungunya and Zika and how do we accelerate the arbovirus work across the globe in COVID-19? How do we ensure that countries are continuing to fight against other pathogens that exist that, that, that are, are common in many parts of the world so that not only can we detect cases, but then we can distinguish between who is infected with which pathogens? How does this affect the clinical pathway in terms of what um, patients need in terms of clinical care um, and how we can protect onward transmission within families, within communities? Um, and so this is, this is something that um, is very important to all of us. We work through our regions, uh, we work through our country offices, we work with the national ministries of health and across different sectors to ensure that these systems continue, that these surveillance systems um, and that, that the medications are in, in countries that need to be in countries. So I'm not sure if you want to supplement. I'd just like to add the importance of vector control and how we are actually focusing also on encouraging the personal surrounding vector control that can be done easily without, with, with social distancing to continue. So in, in, in our guidance, we've also issued the, that uh, the, the, normal, the vector control to particularly deal with the Aedes mosquito, which are, a, a lot of the time is around the house uh, in, in little flower pots, etc., should be, should be continued and should be encouraged. Thank you. Um. Maybe uh, I can just add on this that while uh, dengue, chikungunya, and COVID-19 are very different diseases and have different pathways by which they're caused, they're very much fused in one way, and that is that they can attack vulnerable communities. They're very specific to context, to the context of uh, water, sanitation, overcrowding, poverty, uh, the lack of uh, appropriate management of wastewater, um, lack of access to health care for what can be life-saving interventions. Uh, there are so many similarities. When a new or an old disease emerges in a community that is not well served by health care, that has underlying issues, both social um, um, and, and health care issues, uh, these diseases exploit all of those, as the Director General has said many times, the cracks that, uh, that exist in our societies in terms of social justice in terms of access to health care. Dengue is a very, very good example of that. And, uh, and I think while they may not be very similar diseases, they exploit very similar weaknesses in our societies and in our health systems. And if we work towards universal health coverage, if we work towards strengthening core health systems, if we work as uh, you are working so well on integrated approaches on primary health care delivered close and within communities for multiple diseases, both in prevention and control. And we move away from over-verticalized approaches and we focus on communities and their capacity to deal with the diseases that threaten them. Uh, then I think we'll be doing better in the long run. We have to deal with COVID now as a singular problem. As the DG said, it's a very dangerous disease. But we need solutions in the long run that deal in a more integrated fashion and strengthened, resilient health systems, empowered, educated communities that can access the tools that they need to be able to control disease within their own communities. Uh, many thanks. Uh, now we will go to uh, Jim from Westwood One. Jim, hello. Do we have Jim? We don't, it seems. So we will go to Jamil. Jamil Chade, working for Brazilian media based here in Geneva. Jamil. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, it's just a clarification. What is the current status of hydrochloroquine? Uh, uh, if Mike Ryan or your guests could uh, clarify that to us, many of us are having this uh, uh, question uh, during this press conference. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, but then Maria can clarify. I think there's some confusion as to whether no. they. So I apologize, apologize for the confusion, so I will repeat again. We promise that on the basis of the recommendation of our executive group for the trial, we will do three things. 
Number one, to review the evidence, and we post that in the website of WHO, a review of the evidence by the Cochrane collaboration that suggested, the, the, the review suggested that there was no apparent beneficial effect of hydroxychloroquine. Two, there was a press release by the UK recovery trial on the findings of hydroxychloroquine that suggested that there was no beneficial effect on mortality, on the duration of hospital stay, and on the need for ventilation. Third, we say we were going to look into our own data to see if there was evidence that it suggested beneficial effect. So we have completed these four, uh, these three uh, uh, things. We have a discussion with our executive group and all the PIs of the principal investigators of the trial that finished just 10 minutes ago. And on the basis of this evidence, we are going to proceed, it's not automatic, we are going to proceed to consider the modifications of the protocol for the WHO solidarity trial. And apologies, I was not clear the first time. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, clarification, Dr. Hennau. Uh, now uh, we will go uh, to uh, Business Insider. We have Anna with us. Anna? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Great. Um, I just would like some insight on uh, second lockdowns. We're seeing, um, it, I know you don't necessarily want to call it a lockdown, whatever, however you term it, um, you know, we're seeing spikes in cases across the U.S. and places around the world. And some of the strategies are to go back into lockdown or some of the threats have been that. Um, I'm just, I would like to hear kind of your thoughts on how that works as a public health strategy the second time around. Thank you. So thanks for the, the question. This is, um, it's an important one. Um, I think we've, we've been trying to articulate that the approach and the interventions that need to be taken by countries will depend on the situation that they're in. Um, it will depend on how the virus is circulating, how efficiently it is, how, the intensity of it, and what are the systems in place to be able to detect the cases, to isolate cases, um, to care for those cases, depending on their severity, um, to qu uh, quarantine uh, contacts, to empower the communities, and have an all-of-government approach. And in many situations, we have seen countries have success in suppressing transmission, where we've seen their epi curves go down um, and transmission go to a low level or even stop in some cases. But there is always the possibility that the virus can resurge and there are opportunities for the virus to be able to, uh, to take off again. And if there is a situation where the virus does resurge, then certain interventions may need to be put in place. Um, what we're hopeful for, though, is the decisions that are taken to adjust these measures, whether to lift them or whether to put them in place again, is done in a data-driven way, and it's done in a way that meets the needs to suppress transmission. It doesn't have to be all or nothing, and, and in fact shouldn't be. It should look at which are the measures that need to be in place and where, and in a temporary nature. Um, so the fundamental things of hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, physical distancing, using a mask when, when you're in community transmission and you can't adhere to physical distancing, um, all of these measures continually need to be put in place in addition to active case finding, um, caring for cases, and, and contact tracing. So it, it's, a, it's a long answer because it depends on the, the situation. Um, governments need to look at the data that they have. They need to look at which measures can be implemented where um, and do that in, in a slow and in a staggered way depending on where the need is. But it is certainly possible that countries will need to implement measures again, um, as we've seen in a number of countries now, but we are hopeful that those could be a, a temporary. Um, and if I could add, <clears throat> if we look at the experience of countries that have avoided uh, I mean, the so-called lockdowns are, are <clears throat> stay-at-home orders, travel restrictions, extreme public health and social measures uh, can be varied in their footprint, in their duration and in their intensity. The type, uh, how long and where these things are implemented. And governments have choices. Uh, the more blunt your surveillance system is, the more, the, the, the less, the, the the less sensitive your surveillance system is, the more blunt your response measures have to be. If you can't see very well in the dark, 
then you don't know where to apply the measure against the virus if you can't see it. Uh, and I'm sorry for being so simplistic, but governments need to be working under surveillance. They need to know where the virus is. If you know where the virus is, if you know who's getting it, if you know the situations in which it's been transmitted, if you do case and cluster investigations and you can understand in your communities and societies what are the specific situations and contexts in which the disease is amplifying and spreading, then you can apply measures that are much more sophisticated. You can apply them at a lower geographic level. You don't have to do the measures everywhere. You can do them in one county or in one community. You don't have to do them forever because you can raise those measures relatively quickly because you have a surveillance system to see if something is going wrong. So I do think we need to move towards a more sophisticated analysis of is it no lockdown, lockdown. We need to move into a more uh, smooth, uh, more modulated approach where our surveillance should drive the measures that we take and public health and science should be able to advise public, uh, um, <clears throat> competent authorities to modulate the measures that need to be taken at any given time. None of that is possible if you don't have surveillance, tracing, testing, and the ability to know where the virus is within your community or society at a given moment. If you don't have those answers, then your responses necessarily become more and more blunt less and less precise, and that's when we see large-scale lockdowns that have such an impact on social uh, and economic life. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Ryan. Uh, now we will go to try to go back to Jim, if we, if we have Jim. Jim? Yes, Jim? I'm very sorry, Terry. No, no, Thank it's you okay. Very much. Please go ahead. I was just wondering if there is any new science or any new information on the behavior of the virus that causes COVID-19. Have we seen any advances in knowing how it spreads, uh, the super spreading events that it, that, it, that it seems to have? Is there any new science on the behavior uh, to help us get around the, the ability to, to rein this thing in? So thanks, Jim. That's a it's a great question. Um, so there's a, there's I mean we're learning about this virus every day. We're learning about how this virus behaves and its characteristics. And you know there are really incredible studies that are being published every day. Uh, really grateful for these detailed epidemiologic investigations, household transmission studies, cluster investigations, um, studies in healthcare facilities. I, I could go I could go on and on. Um, and these are the Unfortunate in a pandemic like this, there are these opportunities to learn about how these viruses behave, and we have really good researchers all over the world that are communicating with us directly and are publishing these results. Um, we have scientists that are following the, the virus itself, um, and so there are full genome sequences that are being made available publicly. There's more than 40,000 viruses, 40,000 full genome sequences that are available in which we are looking to see if there are any changes in the virus. We do see normal changes, which is expected with an RNA virus. Um, and and this, this unprecedented reporting of these viruses is allowing us to look at these viruses in real time. Um, secondly, we're seeing um, very detailed cluster investigations, as, as you've heard Mike say, um, where there are outbreak investigations in either expat dormitories or in gyms and facilities or in wherever we are seeing these super spreading events. And indeed, we are seeing super spreading events in um, places of worship. Um, in gyms, in long-term living facilities, um, and these uh, places where the virus can transmit, we can learn a lot from. Who is it transmitting to? In which departments, for example, in, in a healthcare facility? And that helps us refine our, our uh, guidance. It helps us refine our ability to break the chains of transmission, uh, to prevent infections, and to, to, to work to save lives. Um, so the virus, uh, in terms of what we know about its behavior and how it transmits, um, is very similar from, from day one in terms of its, its respiratory nature and, and, and spreading through respiratory droplets. Um, but the super spreading events are worrying because these are opportunities that we can actually work to prevent happening. If we know that they can happen, we can ensure that in facilities where people are in close quarters, we put measures in place to break those chains of transmission before they even have a chance to start. 
So thanks for that question. We encourage research to continue. We encourage collaborative nature in research and, and open findings and having researchers uh, communicate with one another and with us. Um, and we, we know we will learn even more every day. Many thanks. Uh, I have received a couple of texts from journalists who just want to clarify with uh, Anna Maria uh, about hydroxychloroquine. Uh, Dr. Henao. Yes, thank you, Tariq. So I try one third time. <laughs> the internal evidence from the solidarity discovery trial, the external evidence from the recovery trial, and the combined evidence from these large randomized trials bring together suggests that hydroxychloroquine, when compared with the standard of care in the treatment of hospitalized COVID patients, does not result in the reduction of the mortality of those patients. Based on this analysis and on the review of the published evidence, the executive group of the solidarity slash recovery trial has met in two occasions, and today we met with all the PIs. After deliberation, they have concluded that the hydroxychloroquine arm will be a stop from the solidarity trial. But I want to emphasize that this does not constitute a WHO policy, that this is not a WHO policy recommendation, this is the results from trials, and that this does not apply to the use of or the evaluation of hydroxychloroquine as post-exposure prophylaxis in patients exposed to COVID. That's a different thing. So this is focused on what we are doing on the solidarity trial on randomization for COVID patients, but does not apply outside that, and it doesn't constitute WHO policy. WHO has different processes for developing of guidelines. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henao. We hope now this question has been clarified. And we will take one last question, uh, and then we will conclude uh, this uh, briefing. And uh, we will uh, speak to our friend Gabriela Sotomayor from Mexico and Proceso. Gabriela. Yes. Hola, ¿qué tal? Hola, eh, bien. Muchas gracias por tomar mi, mi pregunta. Eh, ah, el día de hoy hubo una sesión en el Consejo de Derechos Humanos en donde se habló de, de discriminación racial y yo quiero preguntar a la luz de, de este tema sobre eh, pues la, la discriminación que sufren eh, muchas personas afrodescendientes en varios países con respecto a, a, al derecho a, a ser tratados con respecto al, al covid también poblaciones eh, vulnerables como pueblos indígenas eh, que no tienen acceso a, a, a tratamiento. Entonces yo quisiera saber eh, pues, eh, qué piensan o cómo, cómo pueden mejorar eh, los gobiernos es, este, este asunto. Gracias. Uh, I can begin. Uh, DJ may wish to supplement. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it is entirely unacceptable that access to healthcare anywhere in the world uh, would be affected uh, or influenced by race. Uh, access to healthcare should be absolutely based on clinical need uh, and never on any other factor uh, for, for a patient's care. Uh, however, there are clearly, uh, and this is uh, important, there are uh, lots of uh, ongoing research as to whether there are genetic and other uh, backgrounds uh, uh, <clears throat> that would lead to more severe outcome in, in certain uh, ethnic groups. That work is underway and is not, not, not uh, proven as such yet. What is clear is that many uh, ethnic minorities and countries are very often underserved, have very often had a difficult health experience and a, and a more difficult health experience, uh, and have higher risk factors in earlier parts of life, and carry with them conditions that are associated with poorer outcomes for COVID-19. That in itself is a tragedy. 
uh, and, uh, and, and it is sad that, that that is the situation. But what that does allow clinicians and hospitals and, and public health authorities to recognise is that if we have uh, people uh, of ethnic minorities who are likely to suffer worse outcomes, then we need to double our intent. We need to be even more alert to that fact. And in fact, it should be, in some senses, the other way around. We should be prioritising people from certain backgrounds who may have worse outcomes and ensuring that they get access to care. But it should always be based on underlying conditions. It should be based on age. It should be based on, on people's potential to recover and benefit from clinical care. But uh, I think it's important to state that nowhere in the world, it doesn't matter where you are, access to health care, access to life-saving care should never, ever be based on race or ethnicity. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan, for answering this question. We will conclude this uh, press briefing uh, at this stage. I would like to thank uh, especially our guests, uh, Dr. Malachella, Dr. Diaz, and Dr. Hanel for their, for their participation today. The audio file will be sent uh, to you shortly, as well as a transcript that will be posted uh, tomorrow. We will keep sending you uh, information from WH offices from around the world on our activities on COVID-19. And from my side, I wish you a very nice evening. And finally, before uh, we close, uh, thank you, Tariq, before we close, uh, I want to acknowledge journalists on this call and around the world. Uh, as you know, according to UNESCO, which has been working with the Swiss-based non-governmental organization, press emblem campaign, between March 1st and 31st May, 127 journalists were killed in 31 countries. Other journalists have been harassed and detained while reporting this pandemic. Journalists are critical to holding decision makers to account and communicating life-saving public health messages to the general public. They should never be a target for violence. They should be protected so that they can continue to do their critical work. So again, my respect to all journalists who are at risk reporting and telling the truth, and we value your contribution. And thank you again for joining us uh, today, and thank you so much, and um, see you during our next program on Friday. Thank you. <laughs>